back in the book of Exodus this evening. It has been some time, but will not delay any longer. Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 16. Exodus 13, verses 1 through 16. This evening, what I want to talk to you about is the remembrance of deliverance. The remembrance of deliverance. In this passage, you see the Lord command Israel uh, to remember. To remember his work of deliverance, how he has brought them out of Egypt. The manner in which he brought them out of Egypt. How the Lord has indeed accomplished their redemption or their deliverance. And he's commanded them to remember this act in two ways. Those are really the two sections that we'll look at this evening in this passage. So verse 1 through 10, you see remembrance through elimination. Remembrance through elimination, which sounds like a quite a unique way to remember something by removing something. Remembrance through elimination. And then verse 11 through 16, we see this command about remembrance through consecration. Remembrance through consecration. Setting something aside for God alone. And that's a command that God gives to Israel. And not just a command to consecrate anything. But a command to consecrate the firstborn. And not just the firstborn lamb. But the firstborn of every one of their flocks that opens the womb. And the firstborn of their homes. The firstborn of all of their women is to be consecrated to the Lord. From this passage, I'm going to make two observations. Because while the Lord does not command us to remove leaven from our house, and He, he does not command us to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, nor does He command us to consecrate our firstborn uh, child or our firstborn of our flocks, if you had any. The Lord still does command us to remember His work of deliverance through elimination. He commands us to remember His work of deliverance through consecration. In fact, He commands that we personally we personally remember His work of deliverance in our lives. And then He's also commanded that we perpetually declare His work of deliverance in our lives. So you can write this down. We'll summarize the entirety in this one sentence here. God has commanded that we personally remember and perpetually declare how He has accomplished our deliverance. God has commanded that we personally remember and perpetually, that means endlessly for all times, all ages, that we perpetually declare how, how He has accomplished our deliverance. So not just saying, God delivered me. I'm saved. No. That we declare, we remember how He has accomplished our deliverance. Pastor Seth was pointing to that just a moment ago. The, the fact that we remember that we are the vilest of sinners and that Christ died for our sins. And who is Christ? He's the Son of God sent into the world, lived a perfect life, died on behalf of our sins, absorbed God's punishment for our sins in His own body and was buried as a dead man as He truly was. And then after three days, God justified him as being sinless by raising him from the dead. When we are identified in Christ by faith, so also God's wrath for our sins is absorbed in Jesus. And God's work of justifying Jesus is also applied to us. This is how God has delivered us. And we are commanded to personally remember that. We're also commanded to perpetually declare that. You will find it quite shocking. Quite shocking. How the, 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 the means by which God commands in this passage, that this perpetual declaration of His work of deliverance, how that's accomplished. It's quite spectacular. It'll, it'll, it'll blow your mind. It blew mine 
And I've been, I've been studying this now for a week and a half and looking at this. And even, even today, going back through this is very convicting to see how God has commanded me primarily to perpetually declare His work of deliverance. So let's look at the passage. Verses 1 through 10 again. We see remembrance through elimination. It says in verse 1, The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate, set aside, the word there is kadosh, kadesh, it means make holy, set aside as unique. Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. This passage is meant to be seen as a whole. Verses 1 through 16. You can tell that by the way in which this passage is bookended. That's what I call it and that's what I tell our preaching guys to call it. This passage is neatly bookended. The first couple of verses are about the consecration of the firstborn. But verses 11 through 16 is the explanation of how that plays out. But between that, you see another kind of consecration. Another kind of setting aside as holy. Another work that is to be done in order to cause us to remember. And originally, that is meant to cause the children of Israel to remember God's deliverance from them out of Egypt. Give you a bit of a rewind and a catch up. In chapter 12 in the book of Exodus, what you read is the Lord command Moses concerning the Passover. Concerning the Passover, the first Passover that was observed. So there in the spring months, March to April, in the month of Abib, that is the first month in the Jewish calendar, also called the month of Nisan. On the 10th day of that month, the people of Israel, every household was to take a lamb, spotless, one year old, from the flock, every household. They were to take that lamb on the 10th day of the month and bring it into their home. They were to keep that lamb with them for four days. On the 14th day of the month, they were to slaughter that lamb at twilight, take the blood, smear the blood on the doorpost, the lintel of the home, and they were to take that animal and to roast it whole, and they were to eat what they needed, and then they were to burn the rest. And they were to, they were to cook their bread without leaven. They don't have time for that bread to rise. They are to understand that the Lord's deliverance is near. There's nowhere, there's going to be no way for them to store, in it, store any of this food, so they need to burn what they can't eat. There's no time to leaven the bread, and so they just need to cook it unleavened. Just make flat wafers, flat cakes in that. They need to eat it with their belt on, with it fastened around their waist, with their sandals on their feet, with everything on their back, and they are waiting for the Lord's deliverance. Now in chapter 12, when you see the Lord declare this statute to Israel, you see it carried out practically. You see it carried out practically, and you get word in chapter 12 that it's something to be done perpetually. Now they are told that no leaven is to be allowed in their homes during this feast of Passover. You get a further explanation here in chapter 13 about what this feast is. So Passover, the feast of Passover, is the meal, it is the meal that opens up the feast of unleavened bread. So this is the way that we ought to understand this. The Passover meal is the opening act of obedience for the week of the feast of unleavened bread. They eat the Passover meal on the 14th day and begin eating unleavened bread from that day all the way to the 21st. And then on the 21st day of Abib, there's a solemn assembly. All the congregation gathers together. Now, during this first Passover, you remember what happens. The first Passover is not an act of remembrance. The first Passover is very practical. It is very practical. It is, it is an act of deliverance. So they sacrifice, they kill this lamb, smear the blood on the doorpost, and the Lord sees that as a sign for them that they have obeyed Him. They are of faith. They are believing in Him. And so that night, the angel of the Lord passes over their homes and He spares them. Why? Because they didn't spare the lamb. That's why He passes over their home. 
because the lamb was not spared. The lamb was the substitute for their firstborn. But in the land of Egypt, among all of the Egyptians, the Lord did not pass over their home showing them mercy because there was no sacrifice. There was no atonement for their firstborn. Rather, the Lord killed the firstborn of man and of beast in all of Egypt. And that night they woke up The Egyptians did, and there was screaming and yelling all over Egypt because it says there was not a household in all the land where there was not someone dead. Pharaoh summons Moses and says, get out of here. Leave quickly, just as the Lord said. Leave quickly. Guess what? All the believing Israelites, they're ready to go. They have cooked unleavened bread. They have a stomach full of roasted lamb. All of their possessions packed on their back, their belt fastened, their sandals on their feet, they are ready because the Lord's deliverance has come very, very quickly. And so there in chapter 12, you see the, you see the command of the first Passover and you see it observed and you see Israel leave hurriedly, hastily out of the land of Egypt and they are thereby delivered. In chapter 13, you don't read the practical expression of that you read the permanent command, the statute that is handed down from generation to generation. It is in law form. It is in legal code right here. And there's a couple of things, a couple of observations to be made about these commands. So then you have this opening salvo, these first two verses about the consecration of the firstborn. Then, now we look at verses 3 through 10. 3 through 10, here we see this command of remembrance through elimination. Then Moses says, said to the people, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. Multiple times in these two paragraphs, that phrase is repeated. For by a strong hand, The Lord brought you out from this place. This passage is all about remembering God's personal act of deliverance for them. In fact, the word for remember there, it's the word zakar. Zakar. You read that word. You've heard it before. Back when Noah was in the ark, it says zakar Elohim. God remembered Noah. And that that phrase, that verb is so often used of God's purposeful, specific, promise-fulfilling remembrance of of His covenants that He has made with His people. And so it stands to reason that God would demand His own people to remember how He has been faithful to deliver them just as He promised. And He made this promise of deliverance for 500 years before this. Over 500 years before this. So he tells them, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. When I read that phrase, and I read it at least four times in these paragraphs, for by a strong hand, Notice he doesn't say, for by my servant Moses, I delivered Israel, I delivered you out of the house of slavery. No, he says it many times here, for by a strong hand, the Lord. It is as though, yes, the Lord did send Moses. Moses was the mouthpiece, but it was God's personal hand at work doing this act of deliverance. What did God do? Listen to the promise he made, he made to Moses there in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. Listen to the personal work that God did. Then the Lord said, Exodus 3, verse 7 and 8, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians 
and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So the Lord says, I have seen, I have heard, and I have come down. The Lord is not just sending Moses into Egypt. The Lord personally is delivering this act of salvation, this act of remembrance. He's even going to say here in a little bit, I killed the firstborn in Egypt. Listen to this. Exodus chapter 7, verse 2 through 4. You shall speak all that I command you, Moses, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. Notice, it's the Lord. He says, I will do this. I will do this. My hand, my people, my work. But Pharaoh is not going to listen to you. It's not that the Pharaoh is just not listening to, to the Lord. The Lord, Lord says, Moses, he's not going to listen to you. And I'm going to lay my hand and I'm going to do this. Listen to the testimony of these demonic, satanic sorcerers who were there in Egypt. Listen to what they said. This is the, the third plague when the Lord brought gnats into the land, mosquitoes. Exodus 8, verse 19, says, Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. This is the finger of God. The Lord is very careful to demand here that His act of deliverance was a personal act. His act of deliverance was He Himself doing this. Now you say, well, I wasn't delivered out of the land of Egypt. This passage is not for me. No, you were not delivered out of physical slavery in the land of Egypt. But God personally delivered you. God did an even greater work of deliverance, not just by His finger, but by His Son. God sent His Son into the world. I have seen their affliction. I have heard their cries. And I have come down. Emmanuel, God with us. So Jesus has come down to deliver us. So I would say, whatever the Lord has commanded the people of Israel here to remember, we have even more to remember than that initial act of physical deliverance. Because we've experienced an eternal deliverance. A spiritual, in fact, a deliverance from the grave. All these that were delivered out of Egypt, they all died. But the deliverance that God provided for us by coming down to the world for us, He actually delivers us not from the house of slavery, but from the grave itself. We have much to remember and much to thank the Lord for. And we have to be careful that we personally remember that act. How does he say to remember it? He says to remember it through elimination. Something very specific that they're commanded to remove. Look at the end of verse 3. It says, No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abib, that's the spring months, you are going out, and when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your son on that day. It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. So this is the statute that's given. them. This is the law. It's a very peculiar law that they're not allowed to put leaven in their bread for these seven days. They're not allowed to have any leavened bread with them. They're not even allowed to have any leaven in their homes. This 
this yeast that's going to make the dough to rise. They're not, is this because there is something inherently evil with yeast? Is there something morally corrupting about yeast? No. There, there, there's nothing wrong with using yeast in the bread. There's nothing wrong with it at all. There's nothing moral attached to it or to the use thereof. But there's significance when it comes to remembering. There's significance when it comes to remembering the Lord's act of deliverance, especially for the Israelites. Why were they not allowed to use leaven on the night of the Passover? First of all, not as a practical matter, they weren't allowed to use leaven because God said so. That's why they weren't allowed to use leaven, because God gave them a law. Practically speaking, all of God's laws make perfect sense. All of God's laws are good. If they had used leaven in their dough, they would have been waiting for it to rise and they would have had nothing to eat. They would have had nothing to eat. It would have still been rising and they wouldn't have had an opportunity to bake it. And so this first act was a very practical matter. The next act, this, this continual statute, is not so much a practical matter because there's something, something wrong with using the yeast. It's a symbolic matter. And it's practical in this sense. They need to keep eliminating this from their home for a full week every year so that they remember. When God said that He would deliver them, He did it, and He did it quickly. He did it, and He did it quickly. They needed to remember that the Lord, when He has determined to do something, He acts decisively. He acts decisively and he moves swiftly. There was no waffling in the plan or the purpose or the design or the sovereignty of God. He enacted his plan perfectly and he delivered them swiftly. So for a week, every single year, they're not only to refrain from leavening their bread, they're to not even have any leaven in their homes. More than that, they're not even allowed to have leaven in their homes territory. Why? Because they need to remember. They need to remember. What do they need to remember? They need to remember how God delivered them. God delivered them decisively. He delivered them exactly as he had promised. So then they're commanded. Now are we forbidden here? from putting leaven in our bread or eating leavened bread during the feast of unleavened bread? Are we commanded to keep this? No, we're not. This is an old covenant command. I was not delivered out of Egypt. I, I, I never had a, a, a Passover lamb in my home. I was not delivered out of the land of Egypt. Now, symbolically, yes, the Passover lamb is representative of Jesus. But in the new covenant, I'm not commanded to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or the Feast of Passover because Jesus has done something greater. Jesus has fulfilled what was symbolically pictured in these feasts and in these acts. However, in the Bible, you do see that leaven, after this point, this removal of leaven is used symbolically. And what is, what is assigned to it is this symbolism of this spreading ruinous, gangrene-like nature of sin. Such that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You can't just have a, a little sin in your life. A little sin leavens the whole of your body. More than that, a little sin in a church leavens the whole church. A little bitterness makes the whole church full of bitterness. Be careful. Be careful that we don't bring any of that in here. Be careful that you don't harbor any sin in your life because a little of it goes a long way. It will affect every part of you. More than that, it will affect every part of this church. You say, well, maybe you go too far here. Do I? Do I? Or you know how I work already. I'm basing this on a biblical passage. You see, we're actually given a very specific command in the New Covenant. You see it concretely fixed in this narrative account and this exhortation, this command, this rebuke 
that the Apostle Paul gives to the Corinthian church. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8, written to the church. He says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. That's in the plural. He's speaking to the church. There is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. They're proud about it. They're boasting about this incestuous relationship between a man and his mother-in-law. He says, you're arrogant. Our culture says tolerant. He says, you're arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be, you, the church, you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So how are we to remember that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us? How are we to remember? How are we to observe the feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread? We need to root out malice. That's hatred one to another. Root it out. Don't just say, I forgive you. Do it. Root it out. Not only that, root out the evil. Just bring it all out. Take it all out. Let us remove the leaven of malice and evil. And then he says, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Living with sincerity amongst the body and in our homes and in our daily lives. Living in truth. That's the way we honor our God. That's the way we honor how God has delivered us through His Son Jesus, our Passover lamb. No, we don't observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Guess what? They did that for seven days. We're commanded to do this every day. Every day. Jesus has fulfilled these feasts and the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. and He has given us something that is far surpassing. This is a feast that we observe every day by removing this leaven from our homes, by removing this leaven from our hearts, and by removing this kind of leaven from the church family. This leaven of malice and evil. We worship the Lord in sincerity and in truth. Notice what he says here in verse 4. Today, in the month of Abim, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. That that list of nations, the list of nations that's given, and that, that formulaic expression, this land flowing with milk and honey, You've read that before. You've heard that before. In fact, you see it many, many times repeated through the Old Testament. You've actually heard that before from the Lord's own mouth as it's written here on these pages. But you read it in Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, God made a promise to Abraham. Listen to this promise. And again, mind you, the Israelites have been in Egypt for 430 years. 
Abraham has been dead for a long time. So let's just say over 500 years has passed since the Lord made that promise to Abraham. And you know what the Lord does? He remembers his promise verbatim. And he executes his promise verbatim. Listen to this. Genesis chapter 15, verse 18 through 20. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. This is before he changed his name. Say, to your offspring. What offspring? Abraham doesn't, doesn't even have a, a, a legitimate heir. To what offspring? He says, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your offspring, I give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river of Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cabanites, the Hittites, Perizzites, and the Rephaim, the Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. That's a lot of nations. And God promises Abraham, I'm going to give this land to your offspring. Abraham's offspring could fit in a studio apartment at this point. And yet he is promising them a land that can inhabit all of these nations. The Lord, the Lord has already now, by the time he is going to fulfill this promise, coming out of the land of Egypt, we are told that there were 600 men. Those are probably foot soldiers, 20 to 50 years old. 600,000 of them, not including women and children and the senior adults. So something more like 2 million people. Guess what they're going to need? They're going to need a broad land with lots of supplies, maybe even a land flowing with milk and honey, a land that can provide for their, their goats and their sheep and their cattle, and a land that has produce, the honey that comes from the dates. So this is what the Lord has promised, this exact promise. It's not just this, this repeating nature of Scripture to repeat all these the big names of these nations so that you get bored and fall asleep. These are receipts. These are receipts of a promise that God made to Abraham, and he's fulfilling. But continue to look. Verse 6, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast of the Lord. Seven unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen in all your territory. You shall tell your son. You shall tell your son on that day. It is what because of what the Lord did for me. When I came out of the land of Egypt, when I came out of Egypt, it says, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. What are they commanded to do? Verse 8 says that they are commanded to tell. And you shall tell your son in that day. It is because the Lord brought me. This is a command for personal remembrance. Now you do see in here the command for perpetual declaring. But here first we see this, this command for personal remembrance. These people to remember that God delivered them. God did a work in their life. God did a work in them. And that's why their kids are hearing about the Lord. Because of how God delivered them. As you shall tell. This is exactly what he, what he commanded there in Exodus chapter 12. Listen to this. Verse 23 through 27. The initial commands about the Passover. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep the service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. 
So when they observe the Passover meal that happens at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, what are they to do? Remember how God delivered them. It was the lamb that was slain for their deliverance. And so the destroyer passed over their home. And now as they observe this Feast of Unleavened Bread, why? Because the Lord brought me out. The Lord delivered me from the land of Egypt. And he says, you shall tell your son on that day, verse 9, and it shall be a, as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. You read that and you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. So what do the Jews wear on their hand? And what do they wear between their eyes? What is this? What is this that they're wearing on their hand? What is it that they have strapped on their forehead? What is it between their eyes? Read the text again and read it more carefully. It says, and it, verse 9, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. What is it and it? It's the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the sign, and it shall be a sign for you as, what does he say? As a sign on your hand. As though you had something printed on your hand, and everything you did, everything you did reminded you of what the Lord told you. As though you had something strapped in between your eyes, so that you couldn't even look out in front of you without seeing a reminder. That's what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is designed to be. It is as a reminder. It is as a, a print on the hand, as a strap on the forehead between the eyes, so that you remember. You keep this, and it is so different. It is so unique that you remove this leaven from your home. It just begs the question, why are you doing this? This would make no sense without explanation. So then it's supposed to be a sign. Sign of what? Sign of deliverance. So God's commanded this remembrance through elimination. It's not the only way he's commanded remembrance. Look at verses 11 through 16. Now we see remembrance through consecration. What the Lord introduced there in verses 1 through 2, now he explains in 11 through 16. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons shall you shall redeem. Boy, that's strange. Just set apart the Lord all that first or opens the womb. Of all your flocks, all your animals. But a donkey, you either redeem it, meaning you buy it back. There's a purchase price. If you want to keep that donkey and, and use it, you can buy it back. Otherwise, break its neck. But that donkey is not for ordinary use. This is strange. So what are they doing when they, they offer up the, the firstborn, the firstborn of their flocks, the firstborn of their herds? You know what they're doing? They're bringing those animals to the priesthood for sacrifice. They're bringing those animals to the priesthood for sacrifice. And so, guess what? When you were to bring a donkey, you know what the priest would do for that sacrifice? He'd probably look at you and go, this is unacceptable. This is unacceptable. Why? Well, because that, an that animal is unfit to eat. That, unfit is, that animal is clearly listed in the law as unfit to eat. But the animals that come from the flocks, the animals that come from the herds, when the priest would sacrifice them, guess what the people would do? The people would feast. What are they eating? They're eating of the firstborn of their flock. They're, they're, they're celebrating and saying, thank you, Lord, 
for giving this. Thank you, Lord, for the firstborn of the flock. And you do it in the month of Abib. You do it in the spring months. Why? Because that's when the animals are all giving birth. You take the firstborn, believing that the Lord is going to give seconds. The Lord is going to give more coming from that animal. But it's not just that kind of remembrance. It's a remembrance of what the Lord did in Egypt. Because the Lord killed the firstborn in all of Egypt. And as a perpetual reminder, the children of Israel are to consecrate the firstborn from the womb. Of all their livestock and all their flocks, they're to offer those up as a sacrifice, the firstborn, those clean animals. But a donkey has to be redeemed or it has to be killed because a donkey would be unfit to sacrifice. So it makes a lot of sense. This donkey is not to be used for ordinary use. It's holy to the Lord. Why? Why is it holy to the Lord? Why does the Lord care about a donkey? It's not so much about the donkey. It's about what the Lord did for Israel in delivering them. It is to remind them that donkey that first came from the womb, that lamb, that that cow, that goat, the firstborn, you're going to remember how I delivered you. So you're going to offer up the first. You're going to offer up the best as a permanent reminder of my deliverance for you. What about the sons? Listen to this. It says, every firstborn, the end of verse 13, every firstborn among man, uh, of man among your sons, you shall redeem. How are they to redeem them? They're to redeem them with a lamb. They're to redeem them with a fitting sacrifice. And if they couldn't afford a lamb, guess what? There, there, are, there are lesser uh, lesser costly animals that they are approved to bring. Such was offered even for Jesus. Now, it says that the firstborn among the sons you shall redeem. And it shall break, and, and he says, verse 14, and when in time to come, your son asks you, What does this mean? You shall say to him, again, by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, this is the reason, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. Listen to how the Lord performed their deliverance and how they're to remember this. Verse uh, 29 and 30 of Exodus 12. And at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn of the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Why do they have to sacrifice the firstborn animals? Why do they have to redeem the firstborn sons? Because that was the price of their deliverance. The price of their deliverance was someone, something with great value. All of the Egyptians made in the image of God. All of the animals belonging to the Egyptians, these are creatures that belong to the Lord. And they died so that Israel could be delivered. So they're to remember. And they're to remember by redeeming these animals, by sacrificing these animals, redeeming their sons. Now, are we commanded to do the same? Not exactly. But we are commanded to remember, to remember how, God delivered us. And again, how did God deliver us? He delivered us not through the firstborn of lambs and not through the firstborn of our children. God delivered us by His own firstborn, by the blood of His own firstborn. So how do we remember? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23-26 For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when He was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's how we remember the death of Jesus on our behalf. God's firstborn given for our deliverance. And again, that, that perpetual reminder, the statute that's given to Israel, it is to be so abrupt, so startling, that it is to serve as a sign for them, for all their generations, of how God delivered them. Look at the last verse, verse 16. It shall be as a mark on your hand. Same language, what is it? This sacrifice of the firstborn, redemption of the firstborn. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. How many times does the Lord have to say that in this passage? For by a strong hand, the Lord brought us, brought you, brought me out of Egypt. This is why I do this. The Lord brought me out. Two observations real quick. Observation number one. God has commanded that we personally remember how he has accomplished our deliverance. This is not just for the Jews. This is not just for the Israelites that were brought out of Egypt. God has commanded that we personally remember how he has accomplished our deliverance. Here's the command. Ephesians chapter, chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. Remember that you are at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near. How? You have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So you remember? You personally remember. I had no relationship with God other than I was under His wrath. And yet He appointed me for His mercy and His grace. And He delivered me at a cost. At the cost of His own firstborn son. So what must I do? I must remember. How do I remember? Remove the leaven. Remove the leaven. Righteous living is the greatest reminder. Righteous living is the greatest reminder. It reminds us that Christ died for our sins. We don't want those sins anymore. It reminds us of the great price of sin, for the wages of sin is death. It reminds us of the goodness of God that He's shown us in giving us the ability to actually obey Him. Righteous living is the greatest reminder of the redemption God has provided for us through His Son, Jesus. Listen to this. Romans chapter 6, verse 20 through 23. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. For what fruit were you getting at that time for the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin, have become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it's in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. A righteous life is the greatest reminder. Righteous living is the greatest reminder of your redemption in Jesus. So then that's how you personally remember. You live a holy life. Consecrate yourself. Observation number two, not only has God commanded that we personally remember how he accomplished our deliverance, but God has commanded that we perpetually declare how he has accomplished our deliverance. Perpetually declare. Now, I could, I could go on and on about this great commission that the Lord's given us in Matthew, the end of the, the, end of the book of Matthew, where he's commanded us to go into the world, and make disciples, to, to tell everyone about Jesus. Listen to these verses that we have here, even from the Psalms. Even from the Psalms. Psalm 78, 1 through 8. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to my word, the words of my mouth, and I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done. He has established a testimony in Jacob 
and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Psalm 102, 18 through 22. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. That he looked down from his holy height. From heaven the Lord looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die, that they may, ha- may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and in Jerusalem his praise when peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship the Lord. Psalm 22, 30-31. Posterity shall serve him. And it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim His righteousness to a people yet unborn that He has done it. Are we mistaken at all that the Lord has commanded us to perpetually declare how He has accomplished our deliverance? There's no question that we're commanded to do this. To declare on end, to the end of the ages, how he's delivered us. Now, let me ask you a question. In this passage, how do we see that declaration come about? This, this is what will blow your mind. Look back in the passage with me. Verse 8. You shall tell your son on that day, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And look at verse 14. And when in time to come, your son asks you. Read that again. And when in time, your, when in time to come, your son, your son asks you. What does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Let me ask you, because here it says that the children ask the father. They ask the parents. What's this mean? Why are we doing this? Why why are you doing this? Mom, Mama, I really like that loaf of bread that you made. Why are we eating these flat, Crackers, I hate this stuff. Make, make the rising dough. Make the bread that I like, Mom. Why are you doing this? Every single year, you stop making the bread for this week, and I'm sick and tired. What is this all about? Dad, we've been, we've been out here herding these sheep. We've been out here herding these cattle. We've been out taking care of all that you've given us, all that God has entrusted to us. And every single year, you take the firstborn of the lambs, the firstborn of the sheep, and you go and you kill them. What is this all about? Let me tell you, son. I do this because the Lord brought me out of the land of Egypt. I do this because the Lord delivered me. Let me ask you, what is it that sparks the inquisitive interrogation from the children? What is it that sparks the interrogation from the children? You know what it is? It's obedience to the Lord's commands. Obedience to the Lord's commands lived out in the home, will cause your children to say, Dad, why don't we act like everybody else? Dad, I'm sick and tired of getting up every Sunday and going to church. Dad, I'm sick and tired of getting up and not being able to to sleep in. Dad, I'm sick and tired of of missing ball games on Wednesday night. Dad, I, I'm sick and tired of having to read our Bible. Every, why do we do this? Dad, I'm sick and tired of having to tell God thank you for the food. I'm sick and tired of it. What, why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? Would you please 
tell me? Why is it not okay for me to, to behave like... Why is it not okay for me to do this and to do that? Why? Why? Tell me. Let me tell you, son. Wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is given to us through Christ Jesus. He died for my sins, son. If he died for my sins, why would I live in it? Son, and if he died for your sins, why would I allow you to live in it? Son, you need to trust in Jesus. When you begin to trust in Jesus, everything about the life we live will make perfect sense to you. And the things that you now dread are going to be the things that you love and you give your life for. It's obedience in the home. That's what sparks this interrogation that comes from the children. Obedience in the home. And he says, and when in time your son asks you, I can't help but think that that question is directed at the daddy. Dad, why? Dad, why? Mothers, this is a call to faithfulness. Daddy's probably not baking that bread. Kids are probably going to ask the mama about that. But when it comes to the sheep, the kids are going to ask daddy about that. The obedience of the mother is the obedience of the father. That's what's going to spark the interrogation from the kids. This is, this is where God has commanded us to perpetually declare him in the home. If we can't declare him through faithful obedience in the home, the kind of obedience that sparks interrogation. How can we think that we're going to go to the nations and tell them about Jesus? A Jesus that we can't even live for in the home. Hmm. But if we can live for him in the home, guess what? That's the kind of life that is so special and so unique and so blessed. It'll not only spark the interrogation coming from the children, it'll also be a light in the world. And when they see your good works, they will give glory to your Father who's in heaven. God has commanded that we personally remember and perpetually declare how he has accomplished our deliverance. Would y'all pray with me?